morning and welcome to the panel. Can a divided UN Security Council still fulfill its mandate in the current polarized world? What's Russia's military aggression brought to table when it comes to need to reform the United Nations? Will the General Assembly have the have to have the greater role in a situation where a Security Council is paralyzed by uh, veto power holding members dividing on most urging issues. What are the opportunities of this moment? To, question some, to answer some of these questions, speakers in this panel, and among them are representatives of two current members of the United Nations Security Council, Switzerland and Albania, are as follows. Ambassador Thomas Goebel, Swiss Deputy State Secretary, Head of the UN Division. Karen Landgren, Executive Director of Security Council Report. Bojena Foshtnarich Boroe, Acting Director General for Multilateral Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs, Republic of Slovenia. And Gazmin Turdiu, Secretary General in the Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs, Republic of Albania. Mr. Um, Turdiu will join us online. Moderator of this panel is Annelise Ferstichel, Diplomatic Advisor to Belgian Deputy Prime Minister. Please, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the audience to show up for this first panel this morning. Um, I have amazing panelists on this panel. Um, and I have an opening question which I will ask everyone. Um, and this opening question is, why are many losing faith in the Security Council? Is a glass half full? or half empty. And uh, let me first give the floor to Thomas. Well, thank you very much, uh, Annelies, for this uh, question. Is the glass half full, half empty? This presupposes a full glass, which uh, you know, could stand for uh, you know, an outcome to which everybody agrees, uh, a harmonious uh, uh, you know, spirit in the Security Council. I'm not sure whether this image has ever corresponded with what the Security Council was set up to do. You know, this is a body which should uh, deal with the most complicated, controversial issues uh, in the, in the uh, peace and polar insecurity space. Uh, it has not been set up to generate uh, harmony. It has been set up to, generate, to, to manage situations such as the ones we're currently facing. So maybe the question shouldn't be how many glasses have we been able to fill, but how many glasses have we been able to prevent from breaking? You know, this is uh, certainly uh, uh, the uh, mindset with which we as Switzerland have entered uh, the council. And uh, while it is true, you know, that we have seen a high level of uh, dysfunctionality, uh, a lot of tension and controversy, uh, obviously, around uh, uh, the Ukraine context, the fact that uh, the council hasn't been able for two consecutive months to agree on a program of work is also an indication of this. But we shouldn't forget that the Council has also been able to agree, for instance, on 26 uh, resolutions since we joined uh, uh, this body. You know, important decisions have been taken in other areas. So it's not, it's not entirely true that uh, the Council hasn't been able to, 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 to function. But it is a challenging, uh, uh, a challenging dynamic. What can be done? You know, we certainly, uh, and certainly during our presidency in May, we've tried to you know, uh, uh, influence positively all the elements which we can influence to uh, uh, foster a constructive discussion by uh, good preparation of the meeting, choosing the right discussion formats, uh, inviting the right briefers so that the council members can have a, a full uh, a picture, uh, uh, in, you know, implicating different voices, civil society voices, uh, you know, looking for a, gender, a, a, a sound gender balance in the briefer in the briefers uh, who come. So these are elements which can contribute to uh, meaningful decisions. And then there are challenges, uh, for instance, in the, in the peacekeeping space, you know, many open questions. And uh, is it good, is it bad? It is as it is, you know, we need to deal with it and find uh, uh, viable, you know, meaningful alternative solutions or uh, ways of using the UN as a, as a tool. Okay, thank you very much. Let me now turn to the other member, current member of the Security Council on this panel, Albania, Gazman. Do you have um, do you have a reply to this question? Is a glass half full or half empty? There's 
several level of elaboration answers to that. So the short and the, and the hard answer is no. Uh, the other one could be it, it, it can hardly can. Uh, but if we see um, the performance of the Security Council from the point of view of the end results of the added value, not just about discussions uh, and, and just dealing with issues, then we can hardly consider it a success story. But actually, it's not the first time that the um, Security Council is divided uh, amongst its membership. It has always been. The question is that at, at this point, uh, the, recently, especially during this last two years, uh, the division is at a very unprecedented scale. Uh, and that is because of a, uh, Russia's aggression against uh, Ukraine. Uh, what we can see here, uh, one of the um, permanent members of the Security Council, uh, a country that has taken uh, special responsibilities since the end of the Second World War, for peace and security in the world started to become rogue because uh, it has attacked a member of the Security Council, uh, sorry, a member of the United Nations Organization, uh, an independent democratic country, uh, and this is an unjustified uh, illegal uh, aggression. So how can we expect that uh, for matters of such importance, uh, when a, uh, one of the permanent members of the Security Council is involved in an aggression, uh, the Security Council can deliver. Actually, it can't. And, and I'm sure that it's not only about matters directly related to this aggression or to Russia, but it's to even other uh, matters of critical importance in our, in, in our space. So um, I fully agree with the answer from, uh, from, from Thomas that uh, there are several glasses and how we can prevent breaking of some of, some of those glasses. But I'm, unfortunately, we, uh, we have seen some glasses that have been broken. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Božena, Slovenia is coming in in January. Um, <clears throat> what are the views of Slovenia uh, with regard to the Security Council? Is the glass half full or half uh, empty? Uh, first of all, Karen, thank you and thank you organizers actually to inviting us also as an incoming member, which is you have a slightly maybe not yet a, a full clear uh, view on how the things are done behind the curtains, but still you're coming in and get the sense of it. So maybe uh, slightly from more um, general point of view, uh, first of all, you know, Security Council is not per se up there, it's a part of the global multilateral system, it's a part of the UN, and as we are observing in the UN how, you know, things are done in the GEA and in ECOSOC, that is very much reflected in the Security Council, so global context where we are today. Um, coming from that, uh, what was already mentioned, yes, what we see is what Security Council is not able to do, because that's out there and it's in the public and it's debated, but there are many things that the Security Council is able to do and has done in the past and in recent years, and probably those who are members can elaborate a bit more. But um, that means that it does work up to the point it still needs to be, I'm not going to say updated, but see in the current situation, today's world, um, be more reflective of the, how the world is at the moment. Um, and maybe to remind, um, I was listening to the speech of General Secretary Guterres uh, at the last opening session, and what he said very bluntly was, yes, you know, these institutions, uh, UN and so on, um, were the reflection, were the outcome of the Second World War. So, and we are not at that time anymore. The world has changed, a lot of things have changed. So we have to adjust the functioning of those institutions as well. But at the same time, um, he also mentioned that when we are talking about the reforms of these institutions, it means also it's about power and it's about the, uh, how should I say, um, compromise. So that's a very difficult, so it's up to the member states, not just the UN per se, it's up to the member states to put that vehicle back in drive. As I, as I seen it, UN, international organizations are the vehicle and the member states are the drivers. So what the organization can do, security and council can do as much as the you know, members are willing to do. And 
always the greatest responsibility in the Security Council is on P5 members. That's always. But I think that over the years, elected members are gaining, I'm going to say, the weight of voice. And also with inclusion of Jerry Assembly, um, having a different role, not primary role in peace and security, but still um, uh, kind to, to not to change the course, but kind of to add to the efficiency. So it's better to have the UN and it's better to have the system than without that. Thank you. Karen, how bad is it and what can be done? Thank you, Annelise, and thank you to the organizers. It's important to remember that the Security Council reflects the state of geopolitics in the world. And I think we would like the Council to be better than the world around it, to rise above what's happening, but in fact, it's very much the same. Interesting that last year, notwithstanding the invasion of Ukraine, the Security Council adopted pretty much as many resolutions as it had in 2021. The number has been in the low 50s. Uh, for some years. So outwardly, it looks like, well, it's functioning as it functioned before. What we sometimes don't see is that behind those resolutions, there is much less unity in 2022 than there was in 2021. So there's tended to be about 80, 80 plus percent of agreement among council members behind the resolutions they adopt. Last year, that fell to about 63%. So these already heavily negotiated and compromised products have declining levels of council agreement. What we're seeing this year is even a lower level of resolutions. We're at close to 30 resolutions and we're already most of the way through the year. So there is a dysfunction coming in to the way the council operates. I think one of the... Uh, biggest challenges for the Council is that there are so many issues it won't discuss at all. So a number of fragile and conflict-ridden situations are nowhere near the Security Council's agenda. We've seen over the past few years that it was very difficult for the Security Council to discuss the emerging conflict in Tigray, and it is not currently discussing the situation in Ethiopia at all. So seeing more and more issues left off the Council's agenda is a worrying development. And the other development I would have concerns about is you know, the Council has limited tools in its toolkit uh, under Chapter 7. It has enforcement actions of various kinds. But there is a growing disinclination of Council members to apply sanctions, to apply UN sanctions. And we see them moving away from wanting to impose sanctions on uh, member states who are taking action against international law, against basic principles of, of the Charter. So I would say that the Security Council feels like a very volatile place right now. Do you want me to go on with some things that could be done? Not to end on an uh, overly <laughs> negative message. Well, one thing we're seeing, of course, is the turn towards the GA, which was very new last year. The veto initiative where the GA will discuss every veto, uh, every issue that has been vetoed in the Security Council within 10 days. That's extremely important. It's amazing that it took them almost 80 years to get to that stage. Whether that will make a difference, I would say the jury is still out. They've had five such discussions. Does it add to pressure not to use the veto, or does it just give the vetoing state another stage to explain why it did what it did? We don't know. The idea, of course, is that it will add to the political cost of using the veto. The Security Council used the Uniting for Peace process in referring a matter to the General Assembly for the first time in 40 years when it referred Ukraine to the General Assembly. Has that made a difference? To Ukraine, probably not. To the idea that you have a Security Council that can work more consultatively and inclusively with the UN membership as a whole, I think that is the 
important development. Because coming back to the question of UN reform, even if formal charter amendment feels like this is a long way away and will be very difficult, there are ways the Security Council can use its own working methods to be more open and inclusive to the opinions of a broader range of member states. So consulting the GA more is one of those. Another one would be to make greater use of regional organizations. The Charter has a lot to say about the role of regional organizations. The Security Council barely uses these provisions, and Security Council report, my organization, would see this as a very ripe area for further development, again, creating a more inclusive process. And the other uh, area of the Charter that the Council does not work in at all, and the Secretary General has called this out in the new Agenda for Peace, is its use of uh, peaceful settlement of disputes, mediation tools, and so on. Now, it's very hard to impose oneself as a mediator, but given the stigma associated with being on the Security Council's agenda, we see very few member states approaching the Council for action. I think this is also ripe for development. Thank you, Karin. You touched upon many different elements, and let me take a couple and elaborate on them further with the uh, other panelists. So you refer to the Liechtenstein Initiative, namely the resolution adopted last year in the GA, where when a veto right is used in Security Council, um, the Security Council members have to explain it to the GA. Other initiatives have been taken, um, and they approach different tracks. For example, uh, there were suggestions to enlarge the composition of the Council, or also to work specifically on the veto right and the procedures of the Council. You had, for example, the ACT Group initiative. Um, in 2013, they proposed a code of conduct for not using the veto right um, for the most serious crimes, crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide. You also had the Franco-Mexican uh, initiative in 2013 on uh, not using the veto right in case of mass atrocities. <clears throat> so many initiatives have been taken. Thomas, what do you think of those initiatives? And <clears throat> have they worked uh, or not? And, and what are the reasons? Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. So indeed, the uh, uh, unprovoked Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine on the 24th of February last year, uh, I think has really uh, given a new impetus to this discussion. You know, we and others have consistently condemned this uh, violation of international law and the Charter. But, uh, uh, you know, the toolbox uh, has not been sufficiently <coughs> equipped to actually take action uh, 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 on, this, uh, on this aggression. So, uh, uh, it's, it's true that, uh, you know, the Charter is very difficult to amend. There are very high hurdles. We, uh, and there is a discussion on how this could or should be done uh, if the time is ripe. Uh, of course, we follow this discussion, we have our <laughs> views, but our focus really is on what can be done within the parameters of uh, the Charter, and there are many things that can be done, and you know, uh, Karen alluded to some of those uh, things. Uh, the ACT group, uh, a group of 27 member states, uh, and Switzerland uh, has uh, chaired this group for uh, uh, over 10 years now, has tried to identify such uh, uh, opportunities and uh, to create more accountability, transparency, and coherence. And the Liechtenstein Initiative uh, really uh, falls in that category. You know, uh, maybe it does not have the potential to legally, you know, generate new realities, but what it does, you know, it, it is an articulation of a collective uh, uh, awareness and also conviction in terms of... Uh, 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 in terms of the gravity of certain uh, certain uh, violations of, of law uh, uh, when the veto is cast to prevent any any action by the council uh, and as Karen has said we've uh, seen five such uh, GA debates uh, in the context of this Liechtenstein initiative uh, each time I think the, uh, uh, the delegation which cast the veto was present in the room so I think it was a symbolically charged atmosphere and we uh, we believe it also has a preventive effect. You know, it does, uh, you know, increase the political cost. You know, I do think that uh, 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 the veto powers in the council will reflect twice. You know, because they know that there will be this uh, public uh, hearing, as it, as it were, or moment of of accountability later later on. 
uh, and the code of conduct you know, goes in the same direction. We've, even though we cannot uh, <coughs> remove the veto because it, it's a charter provision, uh, we consider it to be uh, uh, unhelpful you know, in, in finding, in taking, you know, uh, moving to decisions in the council context. So uh, the code of conduct is also a, a tool to try to frame the use of uh, uh, this instrument. And uh, we've been happy to see that uh, in the last few months we've actually been able to convince 170 member states, you know, 130 member states, sorry, more than two-thirds of the GA to subscribe to this principle, which is, a, again, a strong signal without immediate legal effect, but, uh, you know, I think a, a highly symbolic. How, how many B5 members have signed the Code of Conduct? Well, obviously, you know, those who use the veto the most will, uh, of course, uh, not sign it, you know, not ready to sign it. You know, uh, some uh, have signed it, you know, France and the UK have signed it, you know, and, uh, w you know, so this is a dynamic process. It's not a static situation, and we, I think, uh, this is how also new legal realities are generated. You know, it's, it's the, uh, the development of, uh, of a certain, uh, uh, a certain uh, collective uh, conviction which can lead us to, to maybe to, to improvements. And let me also use one other provision or discussion which is uh, going on in the same context, you know, uh, 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 focused on Article 27.3 of the Charter, which contains a provision uh, in saying essentially that uh, if you are party to a dispute uh, uh, and the Charter, uh, you know, places this under uh, Chapter 6 situations, then you should not, you should abstain from uh, voting. Uh, uh, and this discussion came up again in the Ukraine context uh, uh, when there was a discussion whether, uh, you know, measures under Chapter 6 or 7 should be taken and what that would mean for Russia, you know, uh, given this provision, Article 27.3. And I think, again, you know, it is uh, dysfunctional uh, that a party which uh, is involved in a conflict should be the legislator but also the executor and have a judicial role also, you know, uh, uh, in the same context, it's dysfunctional, and there is discussion on uh, whether uh, you know the uh, collective view of the membership can be articulated in some way to strengthen this idea, and maybe also to extend it to, to not only limit it to Chapter Six situation, but even to Chapter Seven situation. Of course, again, uh, you know this will not develop uh, any legal uh, uh, force, but it can be the expression of a collective understanding of where things should be moving. Thank you. Before I give the floor to Gazment, uh, I want to come back to the right to veto. Karin, um, so many see the existence of the veto right as the problem of a dysfunctional Security Council. What are your views? I think that's, it's very easy to go to the veto as the problem, but we have to remember that the veto is the price that was paid for having a charter in the first place. <coughs> The core members, you know, the charter was drafted by the US, uh, the UK, Russia, uh, Soviet Union then, and later China. And even for these four countries to agree on the contents of the charter was an enormously difficult process. So this is also worth bearing in mind when we think about charter amendment, how much more difficult now to reach agreement on something that for the first time actually curbs the sovereign right of nations. It binds countries to accept resolutions of the Security Council. It binds countries giving the Security Council the right to decide to use force. These things were radical in 1945 and they would be even more radical today. They would probably not be possible today. So when in his first address to the Security Council, President Zelensky said to them, if all you can do is talk, uh, maybe you should dissolve yourselves and start again. But I think everyone understands that starting again today would lead to a weaker product, not a stronger product in terms of the charter. And we have to see the veto in that context. The permanent members are not going to accept provisions that curb that restrict their ultimate right to protect themselves against decisions of the membership as a whole. And I think that is the harsh reality. And I think that also will affect Article 27.3, which you mentioned, uh, Thomas, 
to say to the permanent members, you actually can't vote on disputes to which you are a party uh, if the issue is being, if the resolution concerned is under uh, Chapter 6. I think this will itself lead to endless disputes and disagreements about who is a party, and I can see that mm -hmm. happening over Ukraine. So this is kind of the hard stop we run into, and I hope people will think about other tools, uh, other changes that are possible beyond looking solely at the limitations that the veto imposes on the Security Council. Thank you, Karen. Let me now turn back to Gazment. Um, so what are your views? There have been, so we already talked about the Liechtenstein Initiative, the Code of Conduct proposed by the ACT Group. There are also views that the African members should get permanent seats. Um, there are countries such as Japan, Brazil, India, Germany, they feel like they deserve a permanent seat. What is the view of Albania on, on these proposals and initiatives? Well, thank you. Um, I would agree that the question, the, the problem for uh, non, the expected functionality of the Security Council does not lay, uh, lay alone, uh, solely on the, on the veto power. Uh, let's uh, be reminded, and Karen started with that, that the uh, charter was drafted and the UN system was set up in a completely different uh, geopolitical context. It was after the war, uh, the formula was somehow easier because there were the victorious powers and there were the defeated ones. And it was, let's say, more easy than now that the, uh, the context is completely different. We live in a multi-polar uh, world and there are legitimate interests that need to be promoted. Uh, but just the fact that so many initiatives are around uh, is an indication that there is a broad understanding that the UN system, including the, uh, or maybe starting from this uh, UN Security Council, needs a, a comprehensive uh, reform. The question is how. This is where uh, disagreements uh, uh, are, are, are visible. So everybody agrees we need to do something, but how to do it, then discussions go on from uh, since, since decades. Uh, as it would not be expected a uh, dramatic change in this respect, so a, 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 a comprehensive reform that, that happens in a uh, relatively short time, then perhaps we need to get focused on these initiatives that can improve somehow the functionalities of all the bodies, including the, 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 the Security Council. Uh, aware of this problem, uh, Albania, when uh, entered this, were preparing to enter the, the, the Security Council, uh, we were setting our priorities, and one of our priorities was the, uh, the working methods of the Security Council. And this is why we uh, applied for uh, chairmanship of the informal working group, and we got it. And we tried to do our best, continuing from uh, the work done by our predecessors there, to uh, kind of in contribute, together with the other membership of the, of the Security Council, to make the body more transparent, um, more effective, and, and more accountable. And this is in the general framework of all the attempts that, uh, uh, and the initiatives that are taken here and there in the General Assembly uh, to improve uh, the functionalities of, 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 of this body. Um, what we did, we tried to, we, we, first we, we, we had the meetings that were uh, planned for, for, for this purpose, and there were discussions comprehensive discussions on the, on, on, the, on the working methods of the Security Council. We even planned a uh, retreat in Albania, in Tirana, in March 2022, but that failed because it was postponed because of the, of the Russian aggression. It happened later on in October uh, last year, and it was a, a good, uh, let's say, um, opportunity to make visible again once more the uh, the challenges that uh, that this body is facing regarding the reform uh, albania does not have a uh, position in how the reform should should, uh, should 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 happen but we understand that there is a need for more uh, let's say balanced representation that would reflect the um, the, the, the global situation uh, african countries should be uh, more represented Talking now on behalf of, let's say, the region where I'm coming from, uh, we believe that 
another uh, member from the East European group would help uh, balance more the, 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 the representation in the, in the Security Council. There is need for uh, representation of those that contribute more even in the missions, but not only on the missions, but in the uh, general uh, processes, development programs uh, that contribute to, to, to the programs, but we don't have a specific position. Any kind of, of, uh, of uh, compromise that, uh, that may be reached, uh, we, we will be for that. Okay, thank you. Um, General Assembly, let's get back to the General Assembly, uh, Božena. So when Belgium was on the Security Council, instead of talking about the permanent members and the non-permanent members, five versus 10, we prefer to talk about elected and non-elected members. The non-permanent members are elected by the General Assembly and uh, hence you could say that they have more legitimacy for, staying, for sitting on the Council. Um, what are your views on what the General Assembly could do in matters of peace and security. Uh, Karin uh, mentioned, referred to the Uniting for Peace resolution, yeah. and in the case of Ukraine, but also in other uh, files and other matters, uh, the General Assembly has taken initiative. What role do you see for the General Assembly? Um, if I may very quickly jump back just the, the, the debate about the veto. I very much agree with Karin. Uh, probably we're not going to be in situation to get that rid of the veto, so it's going to stay in place. As I said, it's a, it's a power tool, so mm -hmm. in the realistic world, it, it's going to be there. But there are attempts, and should be attempts, how to limit the veto in cases of mass atrocities. And those are all the initiatives that you mentioned, and uh, Slovenia is uh, very much, as a uh, ACT member group, uh, very supportive of that. We are um, vocal on that. But the other way is also when we see the whether a membership of a security council is reflecting the uh, situation in the world, whether all the uh, regions are represented in a way it should be. This is also one of the ways that uh, actually colleague, uh, our Albanian colleague, uh, um, uh, set out and how it should be expanded to what point still to be efficient. Uh, because if it's a membership too expansive, you know, if it goes uh, way beyond a certain number, uh, it can be actually hindrance to effectiveness. But to go back to the General Assembly, um, yeah, definitely. Um, General Assembly has a slightly different role when it comes to the um, matters of peace and security. We know that the, in that field, uh, the role is limited when it comes to the uh, legally binding any kind of instruments that could be imposed on member states. Um, but the political pressure is there, definitely. I mean, we, we've seen that in a situation with the Ukraine, that was very evident, but I think the resolution you mentioned was um, used 11 times before. So throughout the history, every time that maybe uh, the additional step needs to be taken, maybe the trust in the UN kind of, a, not to be recovered, but uh, it's still there, uh, General Assembly uh, can take up that role. Consultative role, complementary role, uh, the role that enhances uh, the, the work of the Security Council. But at the same time, um, I like one expression I heard, uh, and I'm not sure when it came from, but it was that um, coming into the um, opening session of this year, uh, General Assembly, there was a lot of uh, meetings before that, G7, G20, and so on, and so on. And I think Ger General Secretary said that, okay, and now we are coming to the Gs of all Gs, because, <laughs> you know, a General Assembly represents 193 uh, countries. And there is, this is, everyone has a voice there, even though um, it can still sound a bit, I don't want to be cynical, you know, oh, every vote counts, but... It's true. Mm -hmm. Every vote counts in the General Assembly and throughout the voting. Also through the, for example, when the, the vote was cast for the Ukrainian resolution, you've seen the reflection, how it's perceived, uh, you know, how, what, what's going on in the world. So it has a nice reflection. But also GA needs to have a certain revitalization. It's a part of a, a bigger package of the UN reform. So. Uh, I'm not saying it's worked perfectly, but definitely um, it serves the purpose. Um, so I'll stop. Thank you. Thomas, the G of all Gs. What is your view <laughs> on the role of the General Assembly? Uh, let me also briefly come back to this uh, early discussion and Article 27.3. Uh, so uh, the provision which indicates that if you're party to a, uh, a dispute, you should not be able to take positions. 
uh, uh, including uh, if you're a, a P5, you know, just to clarify that this is not a visionary proposition, it is a charter provision, and therefore it should be observed as all the other charter provisions should be observed. So if there's a lack of clarity, that clarity needs to be produced. But certainly from an act group perspective, you know, we want to continue to insist on a consistent application of that particular uh, provision. Now, the um, uh, General Assembly and Uniting for Peace doctrine or dynamic, uh, uh, yes, so this again is a, a discussion which is uh, very much, uh, you know, a very dynamic uh, discussion. Uh, the GA, in cases in which uh, the Security Council is unable to take decisions, can make recommendations and what exactly does that mean? Uh, what is the legislative authority uh, the GA can, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, can apply? Uh, there are different viewpoints, different legal viewpoints, how far this authority can go, uh, more liberal and more conservative viewpoints. We believe, if you read the Charter, uh, the limits are relatively clear. Uh, but we also believe that uh, you know the, the UN uh, uh, outfit should uh, find ways to address pressing uh, peace and security challenges uh, at all times. So uh, you know situations of blockages should be overcome. We should find ways to overcome it. But uh, there are no easy answers, and uh, the uh, attempt to uh, take away power from the council. Uh, is not necessarily the solution. You know, I don't think it will resolve uh, the, uh, uh, the tension that we see in many of these discussions. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, Bojina, you referred to the BRICS G7, G20 meeting before high-level week of the General Assembly, and some would say that maybe the Security Council, if it doesn't reform by itself, it will become less and less um, more and more irrelevant because other regional fora will take over. And let us, Karin, I would like to address this question to you um, in terms of, um, you know, regional organizations uh, coming up and taking over. Um, African Union uh, is a, a good example, um, having an ambition to, um, you know, uh, uh, take initiative with regard to peace and security. Um, how can security... Council navigate this shrinking space, um, and what roles can uh, one envisage for the mid and the long term? So, if we look at things the Security Council has not really exercised that are part of the Charter, it's really the two chapters on either side of Chapter Seven that we could see as underutilized and having a lot of potential. And one of those is the peaceful settlement of disputes, Chapter 6, but the other is the role of regional organizations in Chapter 8. The Council actually has a lot of authority to ask regional organizations to take action, and regional organizations themselves can take action and coordinate with the Charter. The reality is that there are quite a few regional organizations that have stepped up to try to do this, but we're seeing particular interest right now in the African Union and whether the African Union uh, can be supported by the Security Council in its leadership of peace operations and enforcement actions on the African continent. This is really one of the emerging tools that is also discussed in the Secretary General's new agenda for peace. If we look at where the Security Council's current tools aren't really up to the job, there's no question but that peacekeeping is one of them. Uh, more and more, the situations where there are peacekeepers present, there's really no peace to keep. And what the host governments are looking for is a force that will do counterterrorism, that will do very robust fighting. That's not what UN peacekeeping does. That's one reason we see many host governments turning to other actors, other military actors, other mercenary actors, to support this. So can the council stay relevant in peace and security matters? Probably not without getting into these peace enforcement roles that may be more appropriate for regional organizations to take on. So I think this is seen as a promising but underexplored 
part of uh, the charter to focus on. Okay, thank you, Karen. Gasmet, I would like to turn to you again. So we're talking about, you know, regional fora, and um, during the high-level week, there was only one P5 member which was represented by its head of state, uh, namely the US, Biden. And there was a lot of buzz around, and uh, some, like I already mentioned, saying, is the Security Council maybe becoming irrelevant, BRICS, G7, G20. What uh, is your view on that? Well, I, I, hope, um, I hope the Security Council is not becoming relevant because it's a, a, a critical body uh, that contributes to peace and security at, at the global level. But regarding your question, how does it fit with the uh, existence or, or emerging of other uh, regional peace and security factors, I would say that uh, I don't feel this is the pro the shrinking space is not a problem for the UN Security Council. The problem for the UN Security Council is to improve its performance, its ability to act. Uh, I don't see a contradiction between regional peace and security initiatives and the uh, United Nations Security Council. If countries or group of countries uh, can address their national or regional uh, uh, security challenges through cooperation, but based upon the principles of the UN Charter, all the better, why not? But, uh, and, and the Security Council can always uh, cooperate with them to make, uh, to make things better. Uh, the key point is that these um, initiatives should observe the principles of, of, of the UN Charter. So they, they, they should follow those principles. I don't see so, uh, my, my, uh, if, I, if I try to, to, to summarize, I don't see the existence of other regional uh, peace and security architectures uh, around the world as, uh, as, a, as a challenge, but as complementary to the, uh, to the U United Nations Security Council. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to turn now to the audience uh, to make this panel uh, a bit interactive. And I would like to see if there are any questions from the audience. I would propose to take about two, three questions, uh, have a first round and maybe a second round. Um, is there anyone who would like to ask a question? I see hands here, there. And can you also maybe briefly introduce yourself before you uh, ask the question? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm the Austrian ambassador to Serbia. I served at the Security Council 2009-2010, so we started with a um, crisis in the Middle East, 2009 in January, and we pretty quickly uh, encountered Realpolitik as a non-permanent member, uh, and um, this kept on during uh, our membership. But I wanted to ask you, as experts now at the current Security Council, and uh, with regards to the debate on Security Council reform, how can you involve the P5 uh, to avoid a parallel world of discussions? Uh, you have the General Assembly initiatives, you have many non-permanent uh, members active and discussing, uh, as we do here, but we, I don't see any permanent member uh, engaging. So what kind of possible initiatives to engage with the permanent members or even to force them to engage in this discussion, uh, you could see. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe a second question. I saw a hand over there. Thank you. My name is Ivor Chipkin. I'm from South Africa. Um, in South Africa, of course, there's a strong uh, critique of the UN, a greater focus on the BRICS, uh, not as an alternative to the, to the UN, but certainly as an, uh, as an alternative political space that is emerging, representing uh, um, all sorts of grievances relative to the international system. What strikes me about the South African conversation and the conversation happening at the level of the AU as well and in African countries is the absence of the UN in many of the key conflicts in the world, both on the African continent, but especially now in the Middle East, the UN seems to be quite quiet, also in, in leading conversations around resolution in, in the Ukraine. And I wonder how this panel sees that, uh, whether they agree, 
the, the, the quietitude of the, of the UN in these spaces, the apparent absence uh, in leading conversations or leading discussions about what a resolution looks like, and if they do agree, how they explain that uh, apparent displacement of the UN by other, other, other players. Thank you. And maybe a third question before we go back to the panelists. I thought I saw a hand over here in the middle. No? Okay, let's, let's go back to the panelists. Um, Karin, do you have a couple of first views on these questions? A couple of, a couple of comments. I think to the uh, Austrian ambassador, one of the most powerful points the Secretary General has made recently in his new agenda for peace and also in his comments at the opening of the high-level session of the General Assembly is the danger of rupture. Uh, and he says that continuing with, continuing as we are, the outcome is not the status quo. The outcome is a fissure where you get precisely that alternative institutions springing up. But we know that there isn't an alternative institution that can really replace the Security Council and the decision-making power of the, of the Security Council. Uh, an academic commentator, Ed Luck, has talked about, late Ed Luck, has talked about the UN Charter being designed to survive stormy weather. And that's exactly what we have right now. I think that the fact that so many uh, states, so many leading powers, are not ready to respect international law is the core of the problem, and that so many other states are not ready to call out violations of international law, even though I think we've always been told that it's small states that benefit the most from international law and, and need it the most. So international law is really at the heart of the charter, and that's what's under attack. One of the problems is that rule breaking is a uh, is a privilege of power. And as the current shifting geopolitics makes clear, more countries feel able to break the rules and get away with it. Paradoxically, I think one of the solutions, and this also gets back to what our colleague from South Africa said, is right now what we need is any actions that will strengthen confidence, that will strengthen the sense that aspects of international order, aspects of international law are still working. And there's so many issues that need work right now. If we look at different types of arms and arms regimes, whether it's nuclear weapons, cyber, bioweapons, AI, even if agreements are reached outside the Security Council, if there can be any movement on these issues, I believe that those two will strengthen faith in the Security Council as an example of international cooperation still being possible. So this is something that requires action on all fronts, frankly, to protect the Security Council, to retain some idea that this is still worthwhile and worth keeping. We also need a lot of other institutions to be working and trying to come to some binding agreements. Okay. Rule breaking is a privilege of power. It's a, a strong one-liner. Um, but indeed, last year, um, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield of the US, in her speech about the six clear principles for responsible behavior of Security Council members, she herself admitted, we have not always lived up to these principles in the past, but we are committing to them going forward, which is a good thing. Um, Thomas, would you like to reply to um, the, the questions which we just heard? Thank you very much. Uh, in response to what the uh, ambassador uh, from Austria has said, uh, you know, one element which we have tried to strengthen uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, articulating uh, a more concerted and stronger voice vis-a-vis uh, -vis the P5 is, of course, to increase the coherence, the strength among the E10. So we, certainly from the Swiss side, but, you know, Albania, I believe, uh, you know, has done the same and others too, uh, use uh, every opportunity to 
generate this uh, 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 bond and coherence among the E10, which will never be, uh, you know, uh, comprehensive because, of course, there is diversity among the E10 as well. But uh, there is a need always for uh, nine votes if you want to adopt the resolution, and so the E10 play an important role uh, in this conversation. And often they have convergent. Uh, interests. And then I would just very strongly want to amplify what Karen has just said, you know, in this, you know, the quote you've just made that breaking the rule is the privilege of the powerful. So this is something which really uh, we're not, uh, of course, at ease with uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a country, you know, it's not part of our DNA, you know, we have consistently said that the international law needs to be strengthened, you know, it's the basis for uh, you know, confidence to be built. We have consistently placed very heavy emphasis on, uh, you know, international humanitarian law, and, you know, we've reacted to each violation of that body of law. We've tried to, to increase the linkages with the ICC and the role of international criminal law in uh, the business of the, hum uh, of the uh, Security, Security Council. So all opportunities to... Um, strengthening the legal basis on which the, the council operates uh, should be seized and it, it will uh, increase the confidence of the membership in council decisions and the same if i just may use the opportunity applies to the uh, uh, to the issue of sanctions and uh, karen earlier referred to this issue it's an important tool of law enforcement and we support the tool but uh, at the same time, what we see is, uh, uh, you know, within this tool, uh, there is no due process, you know, in the 15 sanction regimes, soon 14 after the removal of the Mali uh, regime, there is only one in which there is a provision to ensure uh, a due process through an ombuds function, the ombuds person, and I think it would be very important to expand this notion where it is possible uh, to other regimes so that uh, 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 the, the confidence uh, in the work of these regimes can, can get stronger, because due process is a very fundamental human right, and I think uh, uh, all the individuals concerned uh, you know, uh, would uh, be able to confirm this, of course. You know, we're currently discussing uh, a renewal of the sanctions regime on Haiti, and I think it would be an opportunity to uh, 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 integrate uh, this due process component within this regime, uh, uh, and hopefully uh, there is going to be sufficient support, certainly from the E10, to, uh, 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 you know, to... Uh, uh, make that important step. Okay, thank you, Thomas. So you were referring to the different tools the Security Council ha um, has, sanctions, special political missions. We recently uh, celebrated the 75th anniversary of special political missions, uh, peacekeeping operations. The last one the Security Council has been able to agree on, MINUSMA, if I'm correct, has been quite a while already mm -hmm. uh, uh, ago. Referral to the ICC is another um, example. Mm -hmm. Are these tools still effective? And if not, what kind of reform is needed? I first turn to Bojin and then to Gasment. Very quickly on a few of the points that were raised. Um, I think we should never move from, from a principal point of view that we need to stick to the rule-based order. I mean, uh, it's, it's how the world works and respect for the international law, international humanitarian human rights. This is the basis for it. Um, and uh, when speaking about the reform and, you know, um, thinking of P5 uh, addressing that, um, it was one referred also that um, playing the game, which is a zero-sum up game, the result is still zero. And at what point that has to change? Uh, so hopefully. But um, what you mentioned uh, on sanctions, um, um, there's... A, a, a lot of hearing as well whether sanctions work or not, but I, I, in our view, it's still um, a tool that is at disposal and you know uh, used properly and wisely. Definitely, it has effects. Um, at the same time, uh, what we are looking at is also that we need to kind of um, uh, see to minimize the negative side of sanctions when it comes to the 
documentarian side effects. That's one of the things. Uh, with the peacekeeping uh, missions, um, a lot of the times the challenge is uh, inadequate uh, financing, you know, personnel, equipment, uh, authority, uh, maybe more dialogue sometimes needed with the countries being concerned and involved. Um, as to referral to the ICC, I think it's the biggest challenge. Um, just arising from the fact that not all uh, UN members are actually a contracting party to the Rome st Statute. Um, this is one thing, but uh, when you have parties that are involved in conflicts or they have to decide about it, not being members, that's, that's another hindrance. So um, it's probably the tool that um, it's appealing. Uh, it brings some kind of a maybe satisfaction, accountability, but it's very difficult to maybe be put in place in practice. Uh, so it's still a bit of a challenging. Uh, but um, to add the role of the E10, definitely, it's it's it needs to be there. It's a it's a putting a pressure, and probably uh, Thomas will tell us more or someone else. Um, E10, it's getting more organized as well. You know, it's getting to have a and kind of a getting a notion of a group that has to do their part as well, even though their their time on the council is uh, limited. Uh, thank you, Gazman. So we just heard about you know E10, um, uh, the P5, um, and you know the interaction, um, the whole system of pen holdership, for example. Um, mostly P3 members are holding the pen of resolutions. P5 members still share a first draft of resolution among themselves before they share it with the other 10 uh, uh, elected members of the Security Council. Um, what are your views on um, this dynamic? Well, um, I agree with uh, the comments remarks made by uh, the previous speakers, but let me take it up the question of the uh, co uh, coordination of, of the E10. Actually, sometimes they speak of possibility of a sixth veto, because it, as Thomas said, if you don't uh, gather for uh, nine votes for it, then no resolution is passed, regardless uh, what the position of, 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 the, of, of, the, of the P5. So you need not nine, nine, nine votes. For the system of the pen holdership, uh, yes, uh, practice shows that it's concentrated mostly uh, to the uh, uh, to the to, to, to the permanent membership. But actually, no one pr uh, prevents anyone from grabbing the pen and taking the initiative and doing and, and, and doing the job. It's always a matter even of cap uh, of capacities that uh, non-permanent membership has there in small countries have more limited cap capacities in doing the job under the others, but still, uh, I agree that there is a room for improvements on the tools at the disposal of the Security Council, but yet I believe the main problem is not the tools. The main problem is the way the Security Council uses these tools. Okay, thank you, Gazment. I think our time is almost up. Maybe I give a last round of a couple of concluding remarks for all the speakers. Karen, um, what will be your message giving to the audience about the future of the Security Council? It's enormously important to keep some faith in the idea of a Security Council. As I said, we're not going to get it again. This is it, even if it can feel like it's in the deep freeze. I want to mention two other tools in a way that we haven't talked about today. Uh, one is the role of civil society, because people can feel very helpless in the face of Security Council inaction. It's just 30 years ago that the Security Council first heard from a member of civil society. And at that point, they basically had to go to the, to the bar, you know, to the delegates' lounge, and listen to a member of civil society. Now we see civil society talking to the Council all the time. It's become routine, even if it's not always safe for them to do so. More needs to be invested in using this. And the other tool is the Secretary General. Under Article 99 of the Charter, yes. the Secretary General can bring to the Council's attention any issue which he believes might constitute a risk to international peace and security. Uh, speaking personally, I would say he needs to do that a lot more than he does, given the issues the Council doesn't even discuss. So I think a little more pressure on the Secretary General 
to take every single thing to the Security Council and remind them what they should be doing is another thing we should explore more deeply. Thank you. Uh, Bojena, some concluding remarks, your message? Um, in the end, uh, I would say that uh, it will help also with the Security Council to update in a way uh, to bringing new pressing issues. I know the agenda is very limited in a way not to change it, but there are pressing issues more like climate security, new technologies, um, artificial intelligence that are impacting and will be impacting general security definitely, and it's not something to go away from it, you know, or to not, not to enter. Um, very general, I'm a diplomat. I worked in bilateral forum, multilateral forum, and so on, and I just had a discussion with our ambassador here yesterday. It was really something fantastic what he said. Uh, when you're working in bilateral fields, you know, things are moving and you see the results and it's changing. But when you work in a multilateral forum, and that reflects to the UN very, very much, is that you don't see results immediately. So you think it's not working, it's not efficient. But a lot of the things are in, in a kind of way, drive and going into direction. Like what he said, it's like multilateralism is like driving in a first gear. You know, changing, you know, gears, but just driving in a first gear. And it's true. You're driving in a first gear, but the point is you are in there, in track, and you're going. And that understanding for the UN and multilateral for is very much important and has to, that spirit has to be kept and taken on. Thanks. Driving in first gear. Thomas, what are your concluding, concluding remarks? Uh, I would uh, say, you know, we, we live in very challenging times uh, geopolitically and, uh, and in other respects. And so the Council, of course, needs to constantly adjust to these changes by also adjusting the instruments at, 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 at its uh, disposal. Uh, uh, this relates to the instrument of peacekeeping, which is radically going to change uh, soon, I guess, you know, given the trends we're seeing. It relates to the SPMs, which, uh, uh, you know, need to be strengthened. You know, their role hopefully will become more important. Uh, it relates also to sanction regimes, the use of sanctions as an instrument. You know, the change really needs to be underpinned by a philosophy which wants to strengthen the role of international law in the whole equation. I think this is an, an important component, component which can also strengthen the confidence member states and people will have in decisions by the Council. The ACT agenda, uh, the agenda of this group, uh, accountability, coherence, transparency, you know, I believe provides a very good path uh, you know, along, along the way. Also, we have other indications, you know, the new agenda for peace was mentioned. We're moving next year towards a, a council, a, a summit of the future in which hopefully some of the parameters also in the peace and security space will, uh, will be uh, clarified uh, also. So, uh, you know, I think this is very much a dynamic process, but uh, I'm optimistic that the council will continue uh, to be able to uh, uh, operate, uh, you know, reasonably and, and, and effectively, uh, despite uh, the, the geopolitical challenges we've discussed. Thank you. And Gazman, your time for some concluding remarks? Well, um, we will, of course, continue our discussions about the um, need for the Security Council to adjust, but we should always avoid uh, uh, questions about, uh, let's say, finding a replacement for the Security Council is an indispensable body which has delivered uh, for this um, seven decades plus uh, of history, but needs to, needs to uh, go hand in hand with the changes the, um, of, of, the, of the general, uh, the global security uh, environment, the global situation. Thank you. Well, I think this concludes the panel. Thank you all for your attention. And we are ready for the next panel. <laughs> Thank you.